Good morning, everyone. Thank you for choosing us and being here for this session around value-driven transformation. And uh, thank you as well to our distinguished uh, speakers to accept the invitation and to share with us your um, very valuable um, experiences. Let me put you a b very briefly a context of uh, the, 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 the content of this um, roundtable. It seems, it seems well documented that um, healthcare systems need a transformation in order to achieve or in order to solve some common problems they may all show up once they are with a certain size. Just briefly, variability in the clinical practice, problems in the access, um, not trying to do as much things as possible, but doing the right thing in the right way, uh, problems with uh, inequities, problems with uh, uh, innovation adoption, or also problems with integration, not only uh, at the health system level, primary care with specialized care, but also inside the whole integration, uh, etc. I think there are um, good documentation around this the, the, the problems that need to be transformed. The strategy behind this transformation, I think it's no longer <coughs> doubted. The strategy, the right strategy is pursuing value, pursuing value in the broadest sense of the term, outcomes, cost, but etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not just this, but also this. It's the pursuing value. So that's what the roundtable is about, is how in the aim of transforming the value is the right strategy. And for this purpose, we have um, three uh, invited speakers with uh, three different perspectives of the same problem at different levels. So it's not a different problem, it's the same problem uh, um, observed at different levels. We will get a world landscape of how this value transformation is evolving, and not just how in terms of geographically, but also in terms of content, or in terms of maturity. Very interesting. This is what Professor Rifat Atun will talk us in a minute about. We will also have the perspective of, of this value transformation inside the hospital from a clinical unit. How pursuing value in a specific clinical unit can transform in the right way the healthcare organization. That's what Dr. Peter Jacobsen will talk us about. And finally, how this transformation can also occur when you deal with a medical condition. Not the world, not a clinical unit, but a single medical condition. Uh, well organized and well integrated that can also uh, drive to, trans to the needed transformation for every all those problems I mentioned before. And that is what Dr. Marta Sitches will talk us about. So let's begin. We have one and a half hours. Um, the speakers have their time assigned. If we are disciplined, I have no doubt about this, we will have at the end 20 minutes for uh, comments and questions and whatever or discussion among us. So let's begin with Professor Rifat Atun. Uh, professor, please. Okay. Professor Atun is a a professor at the Glo for health global health systems at the Harvard University. Um, it's very interesting to to know that he's been um, assessing the G20. The G20 is the real government of the world. Is where the real power is concentrated. It's a non-formal government. 
they decided the, the year before last to open a chapter for health, health and economy, and the value transformation of those countries is assessed by Professor Rifat Atun. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Paco. And a very good morning to all of you. And this is an incredible privilege to be here in Barcelona in person. Um, we spent the last 18 months zooming in and out of meetings, literally. Uh, but to be here in person is restarting life again. Um, and I can't think of a better place than Barcelona to do this. So it's my first in-person conference since, uh, since the uh, pandemic began. Um, I think sort of two operative words that Paco talked about. One is, how can we get innovations scaled up and diffused at health system level? Um, so I'm going to focus on, I'm a health systems person. Um, so necessarily, I'll, I'll take a systems view of value-based healthcare. Uh, and secondly, thinking about how we can use value-based healthcare approaches in health systems to transform health systems, to develop high-value health systems. So it's really taking the principles, but thinking of it at systems level. Because I think the question, um, so I've been, I had the privilege of working with Paco over many years now. I remember our earliest conversation was that, you know, the models are going to be different in different settings. Um, in relation to value-based healthcare, but the principles, there are set of principles that we pursue. But what we want to do is to move from sort of small examples to system level to create high-value health systems. And I think that's the journey that I'm going to talk about. But first of all, why should we do this? Well, the question is not whether we should do value-based healthcare or not. I think that question has been answered, especially with the pandemic. The, the main question is, how can we do this in a way that, will, that can be accelerated to generate value rapidly. And why do we need to do this? Because health systems are under pressure because of the demographic transitions with aging and increasing burden of physical uh, and sort of cognitive decline individuals. And this is happening in Europe very rapidly, but also in other parts of the world. Then epidemiological transition that's bringing not just chronic illness, but also multimorbidity along with shocks such as pandemics and widening inequalities in relation to uh, health outcomes. And with political environment now, there are higher citizen expectations from all of us, and rightly so. Um, and economic conditions are, uh, especially post-COVID-19, leading to fiscal space constraints uh, in relation to investing in, in health. And finally, you know, the changing sociocultural norms are also driving higher expectations, but also driving the, uh, the changing epidemiology. So the context is changing. Health systems need to change. And value-based healthcare provides a, an approach to achieve that transformation in health systems. Because we now have the possibilities with innovations uh, in, different, uh, in different parts of, you know, of science, all the way from genomics, to digital health, to developments in data science, uh, as well as improvements in diagnostics, health technologies, and treatment and care. So what's been the response to these contextual changes in health systems? And I think COVID-19 has provided us with a, with a lens, a very painful one, to look through how the systems were performing. And I see in the audience some of my colleagues who've been working with health systems for many years. And Many of the health systems that we ranked as being high-performing health systems um, actually perform very badly. In fact, um, some of the countries ranked as number one and two were countries that, that were the worst performing systems. So on the whole, and, and there are exceptions, and I had the privilege of talking with colleagues from Abu Dhabi today, and I was really amazed by the response that they were able to mount. Um, so, but few countries were able to respond effectively, Singapore, New Zealand, so on and so forth. But on the whole, health system response have been fairly ineffective. They've been fairly inefficient, hugely inequitable, especially in the Latin American context where I do a lot of work, and inadequate responsiveness to the, to the initial shock, but then the, the waves of the pandemic. So I think the health system weaknesses have been unmasked 
by the COVID-19 um, uh, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this is an interesting study just published in the International Journal of Epidemiology. This very busy slide, but sort of two important messages. So this looks at uh, life expectancy, at average life expectancy at birth and at age 60 in 27 countries for which data were available. And they compare um, average life expectancy in 2015, which is the vertical bar, and then in 2019, where there's been an improvement, and then 2020, shortly after the pandemic. And in these 27 countries, in only three countries, um, were, only three countries were able to maintain the improvements in average life expectancy. In, in all the countries, average life expectancy at, at birth and age 60 went backwards compared to what had been achieved in 2019. So the systems were not able to respond. They were also not resilient to COVID-19. We're still having wave two, wave three, and we're struggling to, to cope with this. So, and along with this in, on, uh, unresponsiveness, we also see the worrying picture of increasing healthcare costs. Um, and this is an OECD uh, study looking at sort of the base case scenario, what might happen in relation to health expenditure. And you can see with, from the arrows, direction is north. Um, so for the OECD, average expenditure will go from 9.5 to 10.2, uh, and 2030 is not that far away. But in some countries, the, the increases are very, uh, fairly large. And this was pre-COVID. So the increases are likely to be higher. So this is keeping countries awake at night, um, especially ministers of finance, because more is going in, but as we've seen from health outcomes, not necessarily more is coming out. So there's a problem in relation to performance. But as, they, as, as the uh, saying goes, with every crisis, there's an opportunity. So I think the COVID-19 shock provides an opportunity to transform health systems. And value-based healthcare is, a, is an opportunity to do just that. It's an instrument. And the context is very favorable, because just before the uh, pandemic began, I had the privilege of working as a senior advisor to the G20. And uh, in, the, in this G20 presidency, uh, value-based healthcare, for the first time, was incorporated as a priority for G20. Previously, this was not a governmental or an intergovernmental priority. And this was uh, recognized both in the ministerial statement at the end of uh, G20, but also in the leader's declaration, where um, the well-functioning value-based inclusive and resilient health systems were seen as being critical in achieving universal health coverage. And G20 established the uh, Global Innovation Hub for improving value in health. So now there is the mandate in G20 uh, plus all the other countries that engage with G20 to take this agenda for forward. But the framing of value was uh, more comprehensive than just outcomes divided by cost. It was really improving effectiveness, outcomes, efficiency of the system, but also enhancing equity so everyone has access to these innovations, but also improving responsiveness to user needs and needs, uh, the changing needs for each country. So here, we're trying to create value for money, which has been the traditional approach, but also value for many. So everyone benefits. So that means we need to increase scale of value-based healthcare interventions to system level, to country level, to ensure these benefits are harnessed to benefit everyone, not just a select few. So, and the timing is right because many countries are looking at transitioning from traditional financing models or provider payment methods to value-based payment methods. And in many countries, uh, there's still what I call a structural focus to paying providers. So payment follows structures because something is called the hospital, money goes to a hospital each year using budgets that are historic and incremental. So by definition, the budget reflects history, the past, but not current and the future. So many countries are still doing that. But some have transitioned to a functional focus where money follows activity. So payment by, uh, for fee-for-service, 
or disease-related groups. But any of you that have worked in systems with this model realizes that this leads to inflation in terms of activities, but not necessarily implementing outcomes. So, and and this, is a, a, this is a major challenge. But now the focus is on value. Value at individual level, improving individual outcomes uh, while improving efficiency and responsiveness, but also at population level, also enhancing equity. And I think this is the transition that value-based healthcare is driving. So what are the major principles of value-based healthcare? The first is transparency. Data analysis, that's really critical. Understanding performance of systems, but also elements of the system are critical. Uh, so that we can benchmark to understand what is the frontier of performance that one could reach, not some abstract target, but actually what's happening, what is being achieved by different uh, providers in a system. Second principle is optimization of costs and also outcomes. Again, I'm not talking about maximization. This is optimization because there are trade-offs. Third, shared accountability. Improving value is everyone's business. It's not responsibility of the purchaser or the provider. It's everyone working together to achieve these results. And fourth, going with the shared accountability is shared risk and reward. It's in everyone's interest to share the rewards, but also assume risk um, to ensure that um, everything happens in a joined up way. And, and rewards are shared, but risks are all to share. So everyone has a skin in the game. And what are the components, critical components of uh, value-based health systems? Again, this list is evolving. Um, we're doing a number of case studies uh, around the world now, and each one is yielding very interesting insights into what the critical components are. But I think this applies to almost all the cases that we have examined now. The first and foremost is having interoperable and integrated digital data systems with real-time analytics that enables performance benchmarking. So benchmarking sort of longitudinally over time to see what's happening to, to care processes, but also comparatively benchmarking comparatively uh, comparing one unit with another unit or one network with another network or even one country with another country. So that's, an inc that's the critical platform. Secondly, there needs to be harmonized measurement of costs and outcomes. Costs are measured very differently, as are outcomes. Unless these are harmonized, one is comparing apples and oranges. Third is having systems for strat stratification, so that the populations can be divided into subgroups, and they can be categorized in terms of risk, um, so that one can apply targeted interventions for them, not just one size fits all. Third is bundled healthcare services, bringing together a series of services with a focus on the individual to ensure that th that care continuum uh, is, um, uh, is brought together, not just episodes of care in different parts of the system. Fourth, and linked to that, is changing our thinking from providing care in one or another level to integrated care pathways that are seamless that cut across different levels, and ideally digital systems that yield data when they're implemented. Fifth, um, and this is critical, value-based payment models. One cannot value-based healthcare using budgets. Um, one needs to transition to models that provide reward for um, achieving certain targets, but with some uh, alignment with risk. Certain higher risk events will attract higher reward um, uh, so on and so forth. And very importantly, uh, an ecosystem for innovation, adoption, and diffusion, and also cross-learning. And Catalonia is a very good example of this, with changes in procurement systems, for example, that enable uh, more rapid uptake of innovations. But very importantly, all of this requires a strategic change, both on the side of providers and payments. These principles will not be applied just because we say they are principles or these components will not be uh, executed because they're good to do. There needs to be active effort to achieve strategic change and transform the systems. 
And one US healthcare is not just one size fits all. It's not like a tanker. It's not the same model replicated elsewhere. We have the principles, we have the components, but what emerges, and that's I think the beauty of transitioning to value-based health systems, that there will be many different models. Oops, you can see all these flotillas. Uh, so one can come up with, um, one can think of value-based healthcare at systems level as a continuum. So intervention bundling, moving from, moving beyond the therapy, it could be therapy plus, it could be on an episode of care, it could be for a single disease, it could be for a bundle of diseases, multi-disease bundle, or it could be at population level. And one can decide in terms of outcomes, what we call sort of temporal bundling, whether the outcomes will be measured that immediately after the episode or the intervention, or three months later, six months, one year, or even longer. So within this canvas, you have a whole host of possibilities. So let's have a look at some examples. So for example, with Therapy Plus in Catalonia, the cardiac defibrillator implant with transformation of the care delivery process. That's the plus part. Um, again, measuring outcomes, not just after just the implant, but actually over time to see what happens to the patient. Or an episode of care. And this is where a lot of the value-based healthcare initiatives focused on. Um, for example, in the Stockholm County in Sweden, initially with spine, hip and knee surgery, which has since been extended to other interventions. In Uppsala, with using multiple care path pathways, or in Portugal for cataract surgery. And there are many other examples. Uh, or one could focus on a single disease. For example, Marta is going to talk about uh, aortic stenosis. In the Netherlands, uh, diabetes with diabetes, or management of atrial fibrillation. In the UK, recently UK government entered into an agreement to, uh, to focus on um, management of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease for a whole sort of population. Or one can go a stage further and say, rather than managing one, just one condition, we can extend the same principles to several related conditions. So uh, again, in Ontario, Canada, there's a focus on a cardiovascular program. And I believe uh, Peter Jacobson is going to talk about this experience in Denmark. Or one could take this a stage further and the set of interventions at population level. So the quality and outcomes framework in the UK is a good example. So the beauty of this is that there's a whole host of possibilities to innovate using the principles and the critical components of value-based healthcare and for us to learn, not just one size fits all. Uh, or in, again, I try to give uh, examples from Spain. In Valencia, in Azira, there was a population level contract, but I believe this is no longer progressing. But it was a useful experiment to learn from. Um, so what has happened, now we're also looking at, looking at outcomes. And unfortunately, there aren't too many publications that shows outcomes of uh, value-based healthcare interventions at population level. There are many at institutional level. So this is from the Stockholm country. We started with hip and knee, and then spine with bundling of um, care, the stratification for case mix, and with some outcome adjustment, um, and again, measuring, uh, bundling the care episodes and paying for a bundle of care, but with an outcome bonus over time based on result, based on patient reported outcomes. It wasn't just shortly after the episode, but actually over time. And this approach yielded uh, a decline in cost uh, per patient almost 23%, but actually an increase in volume of activity. Um, but the total cost went down because per patient cost went down. So improvement in outcomes as well as improvement in efficiency. And since then, Sweden has been uh, rolling this out through, uh, uh, through the Swedish National Collaboration for Value-Based Reimbursement and Monitoring Healthcare Initiative. Um, and initiatives of multiple regions and uh, more than 50 organizations using open source data, enabling sort of benchmarking, again, addressing multiple conditions, for example, episodes of care for s several surgical procedures, but also focusing on a number of diseases, such as breast cancer, diabetes, osteoporosis, and stroke. And these, these, are, these can be extended to other conditions. So we can see how the experience from Stockholm County has led to scale up to country level, 
to multiple conditions and multiple episodes. But even in Sweden, uh, where, which, has, which was quite advanced in relation to value-based healthcare, implementation can be challenging. Um, and this is a paper we have published in Social Science and Medicine uh, very recently with one of my doctoral students who's doing his PhD at uh, Karolinska Institute. Uh, we did a comparative case study of Brazil and Sweden um, in relation to the challenges of implementation, where to show that a one-size-fits-all approach with a sort of standard approach doesn't work. One needs to really engage in the strategic change process uh, involving all the actors. And our conclusion was that a value-based healthcare transformation requires a systematic and a systemic approach. So focusing on the system as a whole, where all the stakeholders need to be clearly define the purpose and the scope of the transformation, and together steer their actions and decisions accordingly. So it's not having said, this is what you need to then implement it, but actually working continuously to implement, co-design, co-produce, and uh, learn continuously in the process. So where are countries in relation to value-based healthcare? So this was a study I was involved with with the Economist Intelligence Unit. It's a bit dated, uh, it needs to be up updated now. But uh, essentially we compared country readiness for value-based healthcare. Um, but I think since the original study, you know, Canada has transitioned uh, fairly rapidly, especially Ontario. Denmark is, I'm really quite impressed with what's happening in Denmark in relation to all the components being in place to transition to value-based healthcare. Netherlands uh, is, is introducing many innovations. And in Spain, sort of mixed picture. Uh, there are uh, different regions doing different things, but I think Catalonia is uh, ahead of the curve um, compared to many other regions in Spain. Uh, so how do we create an ab enabling context to make this happen? So we have the principles, we have the components, we have now have multiple possibilities and opportunities, um, but how do we make this happen in practice? Well, first, uh, again, this is the five C's. First, we have to consult widely. We need to codify the problem. What is the problem that we are trying to solve, and what is the value that we're going to create? Because value is perceived differently by different individuals. So is it improving effectiveness? Is it as well as efficiency? Or are we also going to focus on enhancing equity and response to the user needs? That needs to be defined jointly with all the stakeholders. Secondly, we have to challenge the current practices. We have seen that systems have not been able to respond, nor they have been resilient. So what is wrong with the system that needs improving? and we have to be very open about it. Third, we need to co-produce. So co-design and co-implement solutions and continuously learn from this process. There are no off-the-shelf solutions. Solutions need to be created in different contexts, learned from and replicated. But that requires managing strategic change, thinking about system design, and finally, creating an enabling ecosystem for all of this to happen, as is happening in Catalonia, for example, with changes in payment models, procurement models, and strong sort of leadership as well. So we need to now move from concept. We've had enough discussions on value-based healthcare. Time is now to move to content, demonstrating how this works in different settings at scale, at system level. We need to move from a general solution, one size fits all, to context-sensitive innovations, and we saw all the possibilities. Third, we need to move from a boutique case in one unit to critical scale. Replication is key, scale-up is key for everyone to benefit. And finally, um, we need to think about value-based healthcare, not just a series of tactical projects, but actually a tool for transformational change in health systems that require strategic investments. So where do we start? And I have one minute. Um, so we can start with any of these, but, um, but going into more complex interventions requires stronger systems and stronger platforms being in place and higher risk. 
and high risk sharing by the providers and, and, the, and the pairs. And greater need for a strategic change. So in the journey from sort of therapy plus to uh, sort of more, more complex sort of multi-disease bundles, there needs to be um, a stronger investment in health system platforms. So what one could do is, is uh, say, if a model has worked in one setting in a unit, one could replicate that into multiple units or extend it to an institution or to a network, as is happening, for example, in Portugal with cataract surgery, or to national level. So replicating the same innovation of the model. Or one could um, develop the, this model, expanding the scope of the care bundle, adding more features onto it. Alternatively, one could try and do that jointly. So there are different pathways one could pursue to transition from value-based healthcare at a unit level, which has been the norm, what I call the boutique examples, to value-based health systems at scale that will improve effectiveness of health systems, efficiency of health systems to create more value for money, but very importantly, improve equity and also responsiveness to create value for many. So thank you very much for your attention. Perfect. Yes. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Atum. <clears throat> Let's listen now to what uh, Dr. Peter Karl Jakobsen has to tell us about the value transformation of a clinical unit as a whole. I'm not talking about a specific uh, condition, but talking about uh, the heart team. Professor uh, Dr. Peter Karl Jakobsen is cardiologist at a Riggs Hospital, a university hospital in Copenhagen. He's the head of the heart tech team. Let's uh, listen with attention to what that really uh, means. And he's in his um, research and development, he's interested in changing treatment with uh, unmet needs of patients, but also doing things differently to improve outcomes uh, with quality and, in this sense, the private collaboration with the public collaboration is a basement for him. Please. Thank you very the much. Yours. And uh, thanks to the organizers. I'm very happy to see you. I think that uh, the audience is growing now. So that, that's good. And thank you. It, it was very interesting introduction. And uh, the, the, uh, I mean, it. it uh, I think we are on, on basically uh, on the right uh, track. Uh, I will try to follow up a little bit on the uh, on the gen general perspective and take it into um, a perspective from a cardiologist. I'm working in the clinical world. I'm uh, an electrophysiologist. I should have brought my white clothes. You need to stand at the microphone. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that. Uh, Repeat this, this last piece is very important. Okay, I should have brought my white clothes because I'm working in the clinic and I have three main uh, things that I want you to remember in this uh, area. That is collaboration and that is also uh, technology and that's also the, uh, your unit or your uh, staff's ability to change behavior. I think it's the important things we are discussing. Um, I want to give you the example from uh, my hospital. Um, just a brief introduction to where I'm from. I'm from Copenhagen. This is Denmark. Denmark is a small country. We have uh, five regions. We have also the privilege of serving uh, distant areas, remote areas, Greenland, Fairy Islands. So we are a small country covering a big piece of uh, distance. Um, the Riz Hospital, which is uh, my hospital, is um, the main teaching hospital of Denmark. It's a part of the Kavisal region. It's a quite large tertial referral center that serves uh, the Denmark and the uh, remote areas. We have then uh, the Heart Center, which is my center, is one of uh, six centers um, at the hospital, which uh, deals with heart disease, vascular disease, and infectious diseases. We have uh, a 
large uh, amount of remote monitoring, both because we are serving the whole countries. We have 4,000 patients with devices and remote monitoring in cardiology. We have a lot of procedures. Um, so that's kind of the basic setting. I don't want to go through this because this fits very well with what we already heard. Uh, we have mega trends. We heard those. We have to face these changes um, and the challenges uh, we also heard. What are the, uh, the main challenges at the moment? Um, I think if I could add one that we didn't hear at the, at the first uh, part, it's the patient involvement aspect, which is pretty much uh, aligned. But, um, and then the prioritizing uh, treatment in my uh, world when you're doing value-based healthcare, and we have done, we went from fixed uh, or pa payment per procedure, per treatment to fixed budgets, to serving a community of patients instead of, and if we see, p if we see patient less than we did before, we get the same amount of money, but we save time uh, and, and can focus on other people. So getting the right treatment to the right patient at the right time is basically what it is all about. And this, and finding out who will not benefit from a treatment is something that everyone will benefit from. So, I mean, in our setting, the, the, the strength and focus in many years has been on uh, research and specific patient care. There's a lot of publications, a lot of, pub, uh, of professors, and there's a lot of positive uh, outcome measures, both uh, heart uh, outcome, clinical endpoints, and patient reported outcomes. And this is, of course, the main pathway we should continue. However, on the other side, we are facing the same challenges uh, as we heard about. Uh, we have uh, capacity problems. We have resource uh, issues, resource issues, uh, we also have issues with staff uh, satisfaction. That means that especially technicians and uh, nurses, when you try, the, the bottom left is a, a score system where uh, uh, staff satisfaction is measured on a uh, score from 100 to uh, minus 100 to 100. Below uh, zero is poor satisfaction by the staff and above 100 is something where uh, staff is very happy. Um, Apple is reaching, the company of Apple is reaching ab above 70, which means that people are very happy with, uh, in the working force. We are below uh, zero, so we have an issue there, and we also have the logistic issue. Uh, the top part of the, the slide is uh, small, but it basically shows you that the utilization of our, our rooms, facilities, are only uh, about two-thirds. So we can basically use our facilities and treat more patients within the, the, the limits we already have, the, the, and that is our challenge. So what happened a couple of years ago was that we then looked at each other and said, okay, how do we change? We already went from uh, per procedure, per uh, contact-based economy to uh, a more value-based uh, system where payment was uh, based on uh, a population. But how can we move forward? And our uh, decision was that it should be a technology-based uh, support and transmission in the heart center. We created what we called the heart tech team, which were the basis of uh, facilitating that transformation. We defined in a white paper that we uh, had to build our transition uh, on technology and health data. That should be the key element uh, in our cardiovascular treatment at our hospital. We uh, had to play a clear and leading role in that health tech uh, transformation, both regionally, nationally, and internationally. And we, at example, we, we wanted to, by example, be first movers. We, we defined the approach of making one example, repeating the example, and then uh, scaling it to other uh, areas, 
but the uh, way forward should be done by small examples changed uh, into uh, similar examples, but we need to start close to the clinical world. And then we looked at each other and said, we need to make sure that our knowledge and results need to be measured in a way that uh, on how many patients that actually benefit from what we're finding. And that means the scalability and next steps would be based on how much it's used. Okay, and what we defined as the uh, way of doing it, uh, and that is again another way I think of, uh, of saying what has already been said, that we had to professionalize the technology area and the ecosystem. We had to unlock the data avail availability and utilization, and that's an ongoing process. We haven't solved it yet, but unlocking the data and prioritize uh, the data focus based on where we can get maximal, maximal value and feasibility at, the, at first. So we'll take the easiest projects at the first. Um, and then innovation, um, a, a point I want to make on innovation is that this is where collaboration is the key word. We are from a clinical world. We have a lot of experience in doing clinical research, but we have no idea of how to implement new technology, basically. So we need help. Then optimizing workflow and resources, staff consumption, and the funding issue I will not go really into. But those were the ba uh, basic uh, goals of our strategy. I now, want, I now want to give you here the last uh, part of my talk some examples, which again shows you in practice uh, our approach is uh, how uh, clinically defined problems is uh, solved with a solution based uh, per example. So we need to put people together from the clinical world together with uh, either companies or other uh, academic institutions that usually work with technology because it's the collaborations that in our mind have solved some of the problems. I will show you three examples on, uh, in the area of patient information and empowerment, how we optimize workflows, and how data-driven decision support in treatment could be applied. And it's done in collaborations with either small external collaborators, bigger companies, or academic institutions. First example, which I think uh, is important, is based on a clinical problem. In my world, when I see patients, I need patients that know what's going on. I need them to be in, uh, empowered, they need to be a part of the treatment. And that's basically not the case uh, when we start. I need better uh, pre-procedure preparation and patient selection. That's a general generic problem. Everyone knows it from the clinical world that you're opening the door and you're seeing the wrong patients. They are here because somebody else chose the patient to uh, show up. We are not in the process of select, we are not involved in the process of selecting the patient uh, based on who will benefit the most at the right time. We also had the issue in this particular area that optimizing staff patient interaction was needed because we spent too much time on the wrong things when patient shows up. We need to avoid cancellation. We need to define the relevant follow-up. So, Going from, as we heard before, from episodic to more continuous care, at each uh, flow of patient uh, journeys, uh, you have a preparation phase, a procedure or access to the hospital phase and a follow-up. By looking at that continuous uh, process and uh, looking at as a whole, that, that has uh, learned us some. Th th this example is then a, a digital patient guide uh, platform. Patient, uh, together with a, a company called Visicon, 
we created a platform where patient, as soon as they are uh, referred to our hospital, they will be introduced into a world where all the preparations before the treatment, the treatment itself and the follow-up treatment is visualized by small uh, animation videos. Uh, the research from this company uh, told us that 50% of patients that are given um, written information does not read it or doesn't understand it. So there's a lot of uh, patients that are, don't know what's going on and how they should uh, empower themselves in the, in the process. They now see all written information and animation before they come to the hospital. I'll give you, a, th this, is, this is an example of uh, how p patients in 20 small videos can see what is going on in the department when they're facing an operation. That means that um, they, together with their uh, relatives, before they uh, enter the heart center, have an idea of all these uh, things. This is a, a procedure of an operation in the heart called ablation. It doesn't matter, but it illustrates what's going on. Um, what happened uh, with this very simple, small project was that uh, for the first time, patients knew up front what was going to happen when they came. We had the opportunities of, uh, with the system to sh uh, get notifications to the patients before they came. We could ask them questions and avoid if the symptoms disappeared or maybe the procedure wasn't valid anymore. They could in upfront um, cancel the, pres uh, the procedure and we can reschedule the other patients. The time uh, that we needed to confront patients uh, when, we, uh, when they showed up at the hospital was reduced. Instead of explaining what was uh, happening and what was uh, the purpose of the procedure, we could simply ask, is there anything that you don't understand? What do you want us to explain to you about the procedure based on what you have seen in the, in the animations? Cancellation procedures uh, numbers went down. Um, and the next step is based on the fact that we know that the follow-up is only needed at 50% of the time and therefore we can, based on that platform, avoid <coughs> patients that are, don't need the follow-up to show up based on notification and feedback on the electronic uh, uh, platform. Okay, we will now change to example number two. Example number two illustrates, uh, I think, uh, one important thing that going from a simple example, the first one, to a generic model where you create a collaboration that uh, is uh, facilitating not only the first example but also repetition and new solving clinical questions is this, uh, which is uh, the two last example is, is something we're doing in what we call the tech partnership with Medtronic, which is a two-year partnership where we uh, define clinical problems and, and solve them in mainly three areas. We want to do clinical outcome uh, dashboards. That is something where we uh, improve clinical decision support. We also look at implantable device data that is focused on remote monitoring. So those are generic examples of where we can improve and then intelligent planning. It involves quite a few people. Um, a two-year partnership involves uh, a structure like this with, let's say, 30 to 40 people in, in, at different levels. The collaboration between the external partner, Medtronic and Resus Hospital, uh, call it different here. One of the examples is the operational dashboard uh, thinking. That means we had the issue of how do we utilize our uh, rooms in a more favorable way. The fact that only two-thirds of the time we had patients in the rooms is something that is important for us to uh, facilitate uh, better, uh, more treatment for more patients. 
this is in Danish, but it doesn't matter. It just shows the concept of showing uh, how many patients, uh, how much of the time in the, uh, uh, each day is uh, in the rooms. In each room in an operational unit is uh, actually occupied by patients. How many uh, patients each day are uh, at time as the first procedure? Does the procedure start at the right time? And by putting in that into a, a dashboard, it's much easier for us to define how to improve uh, the room utilization. This is a new project. I don't have the behavioral change map yet, so I don't know how, what, how much we can change, change behavior, but this is the basis. Okay, I have two minutes left, and I want you to give you the third example. This is an example of uh, a clinical problem like this. We are facing the basic question. Uh, so, uh, in the clinical world, 74-year-old male, ischemic heart disease, it doesn't matter that, uh, what ischemic heart disease is, but the basic thing is that he needs treatment, and there's two, op two options, two ways of treating this patient. Open heart surgery is a huge thing. He will be, this man, if we choose that, he will be in hospital for five days, he will be uh, out of work, he, or uh, at home afterwards for six weeks, so that's a lot. We have an alternative, which means treatment through the groin with balloon uh, angioplastic, where he basically can walk out of the uh, hospital the day after. How do we decide this? That is the basic th uh, thinking of clinical decision support dashboards. Basically, what we do now, or before this, is that we are deciding what treatment he needs based on clinical guidelines, data from the not locally collected, but from the rest of the world. They are probably 10, 15 years old. This key is to use your own data, the power of your own data, to show what is the best treatment for the patient. Things are uh, put in a dashboard where based on basic uh, clinical characteristics, treatment type, and outcome, you can per patient see what benefits the most uh, in, in your local data set in the previous set, uh, historical setting, whether the one um, treatment was better than the other. And therefore, per patient, we hope to change the way that we decide which uh, treatment we, we want to do on those dashboards. So. That's, uh, I think, my main uh, conclusion. I think that the, uh, by using the, the, the technology and uh, in the transformation, the future looks bright. This is the, the other day looking east. There's a lot of light ahead. So I think we, we can solve the, the, the problems with value-based healthcare in a meaningful way using technology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. You make the back place. Thank you. Let's now listen to Dr. Marta Siches. It's our third knowledge sharing uh, this morning. She will talk ab us about how this value transformation can happen, happens actually, in uh, de dealing with a medical condition. We're not talking anymore about a whole unit, a whole clinical unit, as we just have heard. We're now talking about a medical, specific medical condition and how this is also or can also provide a value transformation. Dr. Marta Siches is director of the Cardiovascular Institute at the Clinic Hospital in Barcelona. She's professor in the University of Barcelona uh, she is a uh, board director of the Heart Valve Society. Uh, she's a cardiologist and uh, subspecialized in uh, 
cardiac image, heart valve disease, and then especially in aortic and mitral uh, diseases. It's a pleasure to have uh, you with us uh, when you want. Thank you. Thank you, Paco, and thank you for the kind invitation uh, and the honor to share this symposia with this distinguished faculty. So during the upcoming 20 minutes, I will share our modest experience in starting this uh, value-based transformation, or that's our intention, on the focus of one pathology, which is aortic valve stenosis. For those who are not cardiologists, aortic valve stenosis is a degenerative disease that leads to the uh, narrowing of the aortic valve, one of the valves that we have on the heart, and if left untreated, it leads to heart failure and consequently to death. So it, this is a re, um, disease related to aging. So we know it increases with age. This is the pointer, oops. Okay, let's forget the pointer. Uh, so uh, it is estimated that uh, more than 3% of people age 70, above 75 years old have aortic stenosis. So we can estimate that in Europe, currently we have uh, more than 2.5 million people with aortic stenosis. So it's a prevalent disease, as you can see. Typically, the symptoms are very weak because, as I have said, this is related to aging. So typical symptoms are fatigue, patients feel tired, so they think, they think they are just aging. So they don't notice they are really sick. But on the other side, it can be easily diagnosed if you put an stethoscope on your patient and it's confirmed by a echocardiogram. Seems simple, not so simple as we will see. Current, currently, treatment can be provided for the same pathology in different ways. And these different ways include cardiac surgery, include percutaneous approaches, like this catheterization that Dr. Jacobsen explained previously, which is called TAVI, which is a percutaneous implantation of a pro, uh, valve prosthesis. And also there is a room for pharmacologic pay, uh, treatment, not for curation, but yes, for palliative care. So we have to decide for each patient which is the best option. And sometimes these treatments are provided by different professionals. So what's the current status in aortic stenosis? As I have said before, most of the patients, they don't notice they have aortic stenosis because they feel tired, but they think it's because of their aging. So this is because there is a very unknown disease. People know about cancer, but they don't have any idea about heart valve disease. This is an aging population, an elderly population. So they have other diseases. They have comorbidities. So this implies that they are costly for treatment and potentially that the treatments might be futile. So this is why we have also to consider palliative care. As they don't feel sick sometimes, or they uh, just think they are getting old, diagnosis is made late and they come very late for treatment. So again, increasing the cost, the risk, and probably reducing uh, the benefits of therapy and um, uh, worsening uh, outcomes. Also, as patients don't know about this disease, they are treated by professionals, physicians, nurses, but they are not empowered involved in their treatment. They don't know about the disease, it's too complicated, maybe we don't explain well to them. And as there are many options, and these options are uh, costly because they imply innovative technology, practice around the world is very heterogeneous, and more importantly, access to these new therapies is very heterogeneous. But the main problem is that these patients undergo a long and widening road uh, to get treated, to get diagnosed first, and then get treated sometimes. And there is a lot of uncoordination between these different levels of assistance. And of course, we have different uh, levels which are not integrated, and there's nothing to integrate or support this integration of pathways. Doesn't want to go. Can you pass the next slide, please? OK. So it's a typical example of silos medicine that we know. Patient is uh, going from one side to the other, like a ping pong ball, OK? Because, and also consider social care services. Because again, remember, these are elderly patients. So what we propose, or what we aim to, was to make 
a complete change in the approach to these patients, uh, focusing on the need for each personalized patient, integrating all the system, uh, all the points of care across the same disease, in this case, aortic stenosis. To what aim? To, to the aim to having a quicker, better diagnosis and to provide a specific treatment for each individualized patient. Next slide, please. So what we first planned was to do an analysis of what was going on through the pathways uh, of these patients. Secondly, to propose different changes in our system organization. And of course, this was related to our area of care in the city, uh, in the city center of, of Barcelona. And uh, looking also how we could facilitate this with technology also, if we could in the future develop some technical tools that help us in this transformation and in the care of these patients. Next slide, please. It's, this is not working. So, so, so next, okay, maybe it's, okay, okay. So what we first did was to look at the, to draw the patient uh, line from the very beginning patient is at home, okay? So the first contact usually is a primary care physician or probably another cardiologist, not in our uh, center, which is a tertiary care hospital where they are finally treated. Also then the patient comes to the, to the hospital, goes to the cardiology, then it's decided, it's diagnosed of aortic stenosis, and then the patient has to undergo something treatment has to make the decision, the, the, the attending team has to make the decision. And then the patient is treated, can be treated by surgery, can be treated by percutaneous approach, can uh, even treated with palliative care, and then the patient needs a follow-up. So it's a long way, okay? Yeah. So what we did is to look where were our bottlenecks, at least in our system, in our situation, in our clinical scenario. So we thought, and these are the pinpoints that we, we, we wanted to focus on, we, we tried to address in this project, which was in, 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 at our place, the, 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 the problems of access uh, for care, the, the, the late diagnosis, the problem of our long waiting list, the problem of not integrating the preferences of the patients and also the social situation of the patient, uh, also our internal variability, depending if the patient goes to a cardiac surgeon, goes to one cardiologist, to the other. Of course, there are guidelines and recommendations, but there's a white gray zone where the consensus or the criteria of the attending physician might be slightly different for the patient. And also, during follow-up, uh, there are limited resources for example, for one important thing, which is key for recovery of this patient, which is rehabilitation. And also, there's a lack of coordination of the whole process. Uh, so sometimes we have one nurse looking at one procedure, but there's nobody looking at the whole pathway of the patient through, uh, through the disease. Next slide, please. Okay. I'm sorry because there is, so we decided to, to um, approach these um, limitations or these bottlenecks by starting some internal reorganization that we did at our hospital and some other tools that we did in collaboration with external companies as I will explain. So the first thing that we did was to, to promote some improvements at the beginning before the diagnosis to reduce the time to diagnosis of these patients. Next slide. So the first thing that we did is to organize internally and to put together different professionals involved in the decision make making of these patients. So we put together cardiologists, we put together cardiac surgeons, and they work together. We just put them together and said, okay, you have to reach a consensus on how you want to work. Okay, so you have to decide which patients, according to the guidelines and with a common consensus between you, which patients are going to surgery, which patients are going to percutaneous approach, which patients are going to go to palliative care, and which patients will need further assessment and further meetings within you 
to decide according to the patient needs and preferences what you want to do. Also, they made a consensus on a checklist on how patients should be referred to the hospital. So in order to avoid uh, additional tests, repeating tests, on, so we, we, they work on a, on a checklist and on a consensus on what to ask to our referrals. And they taught our referrals how to work together just to reduce the time to diagnosis, that reduce the time to referral, and homogenize the criteria for referral. Secondly, what we do, we work uh, uh, internally in the hospital to, to, to develop a single entry point at a valve you, uh, in the valve unit. So previously, our valve patients went to see a surgeon, maybe another surgeon, maybe another cardiologist. So we, when, we, when we ask how many valve patients do we see or how many patients with aortic stenosis do we see yearly, we didn't know. We just knew how many cardiac aortic valve replacements we did or how many TAVI uh, implants we did. But we didn't know how many valve patients. So what we did is we made a common registry for these patients. So now we are starting to know how many uh, aortic stenosis patients, not how many procedures we do every year. Finally, as I have said, not finally, but thirdly, as I have said, we taught our referrals how to send the patients to our center. So we, um, we, uh, we, we, we discussed with them our criteria and how should be uh, imaging perform, uh, test, work lab analytics, etc. perform to be referred. And also, we work on educating patients. So fortunately, we, we, we live in an integrated area health, health area, so we have the connection with our primary care physicians and centers. So we went to the uh, primary, we are going to the primary care centers to educate these patients and to increase awareness of aortic stenosis uh, among citizens of our area. For internally, we just to reduce the time to a di diagnosis, you, having this single entry point at our valve center, we started a virtual consultation with two cardiologists that have already agreed with the cardiac surgeons and with the interventional cardiologists performing the procedures and also with the doctors uh, taking care of palliative care. They have already agreed on what to do for each patient. So we do a virtual consultation. So the, pa the, 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 um, the referral arrives with a checklist with the uh, the, the agreed items that we have set and that we have talked with our referrals, so that these two attending cardiologists, they just do a virtual consultation and they already can distribute patients to cardiac surgery, intervention, uh, percutaneous intervention, palliative care, or to heart team discussion. And finally, for these patients that need further investigation, we have this high resolution consultation that means that the same attending cardiologist performs the echocardiography, which is the method of choice to confirm the diagnosis and to assess the severity and the indication of intervention. So this, is, this was the long and windy road that the patient experienced at our hospital. I'm not talking on the previous excursions of the patient. So the patient came to one cardiologist, the cardiologist asked for an echocardiography, then came back to the cardiology to show the result of the echocardiography. Then the, car echo the cardiologist said, oh, I'm going to send to the surgeon. The surgeon said, no, no, this is high risk. He should go undergo percutaneous intervention. Then they sent to another cardiologist that was doing the intervention. Then he asked for more te diagnostic tests. Uh, and then he went back to the cardiologist and then finally it was presented on a heart team, which is a group of, of uh, cardiologists and cardiac surgeons that decide the technical approach of the procedure. And finally, after three, four months, in the best case, uh, the intervention was performed. Next slide. So now, with this virtual consultation and this high resolution and these things that we have done, the patient is already classified and the intervention time has been reduced to one month. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so we have reduced the time for the diagnosis and the time to treatment, of course. And we have been working with this agreement within our group, this single entry point. But we want to improve more things. 
So we want to improve, we have a uh, deal with the variability of protocols, but we also want to involve more the patients, which is another point that was already mentioned uh, by Dr. Sh uh, Jacobson. So we think the patients, uh, as I have said, there's low awareness uh, among citizenships, uh, citizens uh, about aortic stenosis. So we want to teach or increase the awareness of this disease among the population. But also once the patient is in our center, as done in, in Derman, we want, we want to prepare our patients. We want our patients to be their best doctor for treating their disease, which is aortic stenosis. So we uh, develop together with Medtronic an app that informs the patient on the disease. Next slide, please that informs the patient on the disease, that prepares the patient for the intervention, and also that helps, next slide, that uh, helps the patient, uh, next, uh, that prepares the patient, that prepares the patient for, um, for the intervention. So this app for, for patient is, is uh, brought to the patient with nurses, typically the case manager, so they, we invite the patients for using this tool, and the, this, this uh, helps the communication also with the hospital. So first, for education of the disease, second, for preparation of the intervention, and thirdly, for follow-up. Also, in those patients with palliative care who have usually uh, um, hosp um, hospital at home, this is also used for the follow-up uh, of this patient. Next slide, please. Next. Finally, next, next. We haven't started yet, but the next step would be to do a whole digitized platform to integrate all these points. So this platform doesn't plan to uh, substitute the case manager or physicians. It's just a help, as said also by the previous speaker, to carry on all these procedures. Next slide, please. Next. Uh, to connect all the parts on the team, to integrate them, and to make things happen at the right time. So just to send a reminder to every actor in this process. This is a still work uh, on, on, on prog in progress, but this is what, how we envisage the end stage of this uh, project very similar to what has been proposed uh, in, in Denmark. Next one, please. Next slide. And this is indeed not uh, a new idea. This is something that patients have been claiming for years. This is completely in keeping what patient associations are telling us, that they feel lost. They feel lost because they go to one doctor, one doctor says, oh, you should do this. They go to another doctor, you should do that. And maybe they know that there is one center that, that does one operation with some outcomes and the other in, uh, center does the other operation or the same operation with other outcomes. So patients want to know. They want to know and they, got, they want also to get involved in their, in their own treatment. This is something that it's been uh, very uh, much um, developed for diabetes or, or renal failure for very chronic diseases, but it's not so usual in the cardiovascular field. So they are claiming for this, and we are just trying to reorder or transform our systems to respond to their, their needs. Next page, please. Next slide. <laughs> Also, from uh, Health Economic with our Department of Innovation, we ha they, they have made an estimation of how good this, this approach uh, behave in the future. And these are simulation data uh, based on economic models and on cost of procedures published in the literature. And I'm not an expert on this, so see everybody wants, every, anyone wants details on the methodology, I will give you to the right person. But next slide, please. They have, uh, they have estimated that this is uh, going to reduce mortality and increase uh, uh, years of life, uh, and also importantly, particularly in patients who are elderly, quality of life. And also, next slide, this is going to be, uh, globally speaking, costly, less costly and more effectively. Next slide, please. 
And also, it's going in this estimation, that it's an estimation made on treating like this around 20,000 patients in Europe, the estimation that there's a cost savings of nearly 100 million of euro. Of course, this is a simulation. We need the upcoming years to develop this project and confirm that this is going to be uh, true or not. Next slide, please. Uh, we have taken advantage of the Catalonia situation, as Professor Atun has already mentioned, that uh, from the, um, the government, the Catalan government, there has been several uh, actions to incorporate, uptake innovation in health, uh, in our health system. So in, 20, in 2017, there was a call for public procurement of innovative solutions, and we applied to that call and we got this project funded, MITMEVA, which is the Catalan translation of ITMAS, is exactly the same. So with this, we could, next slide, please, uh, transform our approach to aortic stenosis in this way. Next, next slide, please. So next, okay, instead of buying aortic valve prosthesis as we used to do to treat these patients, we added some value to this procurement. So what, next slide, please. Uh, so what we did is to include these services to, the, uh, to, to buying these processes. We also bought also services for better treating these patients. And, though, and this uh, included, next slide, I don't know it would, but okay. This include tools for education of patients, tools for referral education, so this is how we are performing now, this citizen education. These, uh, these uh, talks also for our referrals, primary care physicians, not only cardiologists. We are uh, acquiring these M tools uh, for su uh, supporting patients, this app. Also, uh, um, digitized tools to connect cardiologists from different centers, not to use Zoom and also incorporating monitoring of outcomes and also uh, analysis of cost effectiveness and also incorporating a small piece of outcome-based payment and resharing with these companies. Finally, after this, we will also proceed with an scalability study of our approach because maybe we have a situation which is not exactly the same in other areas. Next slide. And this uh, procurement has been is currently ongoing, and it's, uh, I think it's the nice thing is that it's uh, being done also with partnership with several companies. So I think that's also important because there is a learning curve for us as physicians or uh, health professionals, but also for companies. So the more we are, the better, I think. Next slide. But this has to be sustainable. And let me share with you, this is one business model proposed uh, precisely by Medtronic, but there might be others. So this can work from companies also to provide to hospitals or to health system areas as different uh, ways of, uh, of business. So probably like one process uh, fee or like services fee or licenses or a whole uh, a whole uh, basement paid model. So I think these are different steps, different models, and we need to see which one is best for uh, each scenario. But I think there's a huge possibility, as uh, illustrated nicely from Dr. from Professor Atun, to work on this. And I think also, like Dr. Jacobson, that the future is bright and that we really have very good opportunities. And, and an obligation because patients are really asking for that. We need to give that for patients. And patients will come to ask and, and, see, and, and, and ask for this uh, transformation. So thank you very much for your attention and sorry for the technical problems. Next slide. <laughs> Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Marta Siches. So that was all. I think we have had a very impressive and very relevant intervention. It's now the turn to come up with uh, question, comments. I have already uh, in the laptop, in the in my in the iPad, some questions 
um, that are already here. May I read them for you? Bundle payment, rewarding outcomes rather than outputs, is the way to go. Those working in the public sector in Spain, we feel we are heading toward a system which enhances control on administrative procedures rather than results. How can we reverse it? So the question is around, um, um, we're not moving, we're in Spain, we're not moving to reward uh, outcomes, we are moving toward controlling a cost. My, my, my interpretation of this question would be for the speakers. Is that a Spanish problem, isolated Spanish problem, or do you think this is a problem that could be uh, found more generalized? I think I'll, I'll start. That's a really great question. And as, as, as I've shown, if you have payment models that follow activity, you'll measure activity. So, but you can be efficient, but very ineffective. So focusing on value uh, enables not just implementing efficiency. It's important to reduce cost or optimize cost. Uh, sometimes cost will go up, but if the outcomes improve, this, this is what we want. Um, it's still, we're still generating value. Um, because, for example, in, in the cases that we've heard, really great cases, um, some features are added to a technology that might increase for that particular intervention, the cost per patient, but overall cost declines. The system level cost declines. So it's very important to really know what you're measuring. Uh, cost of an episode might increase, but overall cost might decline. Um, but what's important is that with value, we're improving outcomes, effectiveness, but also because we have, in both cases, really quite amazing pathways. By applying this consistently, we also enhance equity because everyone is getting high quality or highly effective care. But very importantly, we improve responsiveness to users because patient engagement is at every stage, but also to clinicians. Uh, important to ensure that they're also satisfied. So undue focus on measuring process is not the way to improve health systems. This is why health systems are suffering. Thank you. The question was maybe for Dr. Jacobsen. Do you think this is a typical Spanish problem? This uh, focusing on no. on structural funding, as you as you no. uh, call it. No, I, I think I completely agree that that is a general problem, uh, and um, we know it, uh, at least in all parts of the world that I've visited. Um, I think the main uh, balance between control and um, not controlling is difficult, but, but in my opinion, we tend to treat too much. So if we can encourage a system where we can balance the outcomes and and not doing too much i think there's much to gain but but of course we need some system that can control but i, I think still that we can make a simple solution even though it, it's not based on activity but it's based on serving a population because that that is the way forward yeah. okay. thank you we have another question uh, <coughs> sorry, to work in preferences and social determinants, to take frailty into account, have you integrated other disciplines, social workers, geriatricians? Marta? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, we have integrated uh, geriatricians for the procedures also anesthesiologists. And we are trying to work, uh, tr we are trying to integrate uh, the primary care physicians and the social workers in the, in the area. Yes, I think that's definitely yeah. uh, essential. Yeah. And, and that is really key, actually, with an aging population. As Marta showed, um, the, the process has moved from focusing on episode of care in one silo to actually managing the whole pathway pre, during, and post and understanding individual characteristics and managing those prior to admission is key. Um, and also 
by understanding that one can manage better the intra um, hospital or institutional process but also very importantly post discharge because this individual will go back to their sort of normal life if that system is not functioning one will not realize the outcomes I did a study in a high income country um, which will remain nameless uh, they ha that has a really ho excellent hospital system the hospital episodes were excellent in terms of their management but the problem was that the pre-work was not good and the post-work was not good. So patients presented late with multiple morbidities. They did really well in the hospital, but when one looks at 30-day um, mortality, 90-day mortality, and one-year mortality, because the primary and the social care system wasn't well established, the outcomes were far worse than comparable countries. So this integrated, integrated management of individual not the patient. Patient is a patient when they're in hospital. We have to manage the whole pathway for the individual, not just during the episode, but before and after. And understanding social determinants and, uh, and addressing them is key. Uh, thank you. If, if I may add also what the examples uh, here today show, how different uh, cases could be. So how important it is that it's not a one size fits all, that it is actually individual uh, mapping of, of, of patient uh, journeys uh, and it will not be the same for yeah. Barcelona, Copenhagen or whatever. <laughs> it, it needs a lot of work to find how to, how to put the team, the right team together, how to optimize the journey. Absolutely. That, that I see you've done a lot of uh, very, very amazing work on mapping all those uh, things. Yeah, but I think that w there are a lot of common elements. Of mm. course, it depends a little mm. bit of if you're in a public, private mm. system mm. And, and how is the situation in each particular case, a scenario, no? But I think that m this mapping can be done in, in uh, that's completely scalable to any, mm. any place, no? Thank you. Um, I have a question myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> because I was... I'm really interested in the point you made about collaboration. Indirectly, you both uh, talked about it in your presentations. And my question is, to what extent do you think that this collaboration can represent a reduction or a, or, or a, yeah, a reduction of the clinical autonomy, of the clinical independence? To what extent this collaboration um, makes a losing sovereignty of the clinical part of the intervention. <laughs> I think it's the toll you need to pay to make it sustainable uh, and to make it work because it's not going to work otherwise. I mean, there are too many options that can be only decided on one person. So probably you need a whole team, not to decide because this is not practical, of course, but at least uh, everybody has to be comfortable and there's, <laughs> I usually you say a very colloquial uh, sentence, no? so th there's enough cake for everybody. We just need to agree how we cut the cake. <laughs> but I think there's, because if not, the other way is just who arrives first or who is more aggressive and that's not good for the patient. The patient needs the best solution at the right time. And of course, there might be a toll of autonomy, but if we need to work within a team and to provide the best care, I think that's the way to go. I, I totally agree. I, I think that it's basically from my uh, <coughs> point of view also that uh, as a doctor working in a public system, I need to make the best for my patient and also in that case to use my resources the best. It's like, bu it's like building a, a new hi house at home. I will ask the people that knows best. So, I mean, I don't think we sacrifice autonomy, but I want the best people to help me with uh, helping the patient. And, and the collaboration is the key because this is new areas. We, we don't have the expertise, but we're used to asking other doctors if we don't know the answer. So now we just need to ask other people as we used to do. Yes. And of course, we, we need to balance the, the public-private uh, collaborations, but I don't think that's a problem. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, collaboration is key because as we saw in, in both um, uh, Peter Carl's presentation, but also Marta's presentation, the pathways are quite complex. Um, we, are not we are not dealing with a single intervention that is momentary. 
This is a journey. We heard, for example, with air stenosis patients, you know, five months with multiple points, multiple uh, interactions, multiple individuals. So collaboration is not a luxury. It has to happen to manage this process efficiently. And as we deal with more complex conditions, with especially chronic conditions that needs to be managed over time, collaboration is key and user engagement is, is key. It doesn't register autonomy, it actually empowers everyone and enables, enables each individual to discharge their duties and roles and responsibilities in the most optimal way. Thank you very much. We have still a um, couple of questions pending, but time is um, away. I think uh, I have um, enjoyed a lot of the session, and um, I invite you to say thank you again to our speaker. Thank you.